How's it going there fellow adventurers? I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and today we're going to take a new journey, a different journey, because today we're going to discuss the lovely ninth world of Numenera. Isn't that pretty? It's just pretty. Get your D20s. This is going to be a level 10 episode on WebDO. <laughs> Well, Jim, yeah. it's going to be a bit of a shock, a bit oh, of a man. system shock. It's a bit of a system shock. We better roll our constitution saving throws. Wait, our, no, no, no. Wait, that's... Uh, that's uh, no, it's uh, going to be might defense. Mixed. It's a might defense now, yes. Let's talk about Numenera, a different game. It's a different game. And, you know, honestly, we've talked about Numenera, talked around Numenera yeah. on the show before, and we've mentioned if we'd like to do a show on it, we'd like to. It, it, <laughs> sorry. It's my favorite game at the moment, hands down. Yeah. So we play a lot of 5th edition because the group as a whole likes Dungeons and Dragons. And, yes. And the group as a whole prefers Dungeons and Dragons as, as, a, as a system. But for me personally, I am much more excited about Numenera uh, and the Cypher system in general because it's, uh, I, I, I really just love everything about it. Exactly. Um, and so I've had an opportunity to run a couple of games using both Numenera and the Cypher system, which is for our viewers who might not be familiar with it, Numenera is a... Uh, a, both a setting and a system that came mm -hmm. out by Monty Cook a couple of years ago. Monty Cook, of course, was heavily involved in second and third edition Dungeons and Dragons. Yep. Um, I believe maybe even uh, past third edition. So it's from his uh, game company, Numenera. There's a couple of other systems. The Strange is another one. I mm -hmm. uh, haven't had an opportunity to play The Strange, but we're talking about one day. Yes. Uh, but we're talking specifically about Numenera, both the setting that's uh, in it, the Ninth World, as well as the Cypher system which Numenera uses, okay. of which there's also a generic version uh, out there. Start with the setting, just the setup of this. Right. So the setup is the ninth world. It's a billion years into Earth's future. That should immediately, for anyone sort of who's, who's got a mind for that kind of thing or sort of familiar mm -hmm. with, with what uh, projections about life in uh, a billion years from now would be, this is very clearly Earth uh, that's been engineered and shaped, and not just Earth, but the solar system yeah. has been engineered and shaped to make life still possible on Earth in a billion years. Yeah. The oceans haven't boiled away. Uh, it's not just a vast desert like, say, Mars is. Uh, now, it, it, it's still, life is still possible. There's a supercontinent on it um, that's pretty clearly engineered to be a certain way and look a certain way. There's no mercury left. That, that's gone and disappeared. The moon is further outside of Earth's orbit than it has been. So it's a world in which uh, eight other civilizations have called Earth home or are called Earth sort of the center of their intergalactic civilization. Yeah. Um, a billion years is obviously a long time, mm -hmm. uh, but it's called the ninth world because it is the sort of a thousand years in the past is where the ninth world's history begins. Yeah. And pretty clearly there's this huge weight of history that the people of the ninth world are vaguely aware of. Uh, but they otherwise live in the shadow of these eight other civilizations. And the book's very vague on what those eight other civilizations were. Some of them were human, some of them were alien, some of them were interplanetary, some of them were intergalactic. But the point of the whole thing and why, the, why it's called Numenera in the first place is Numenera is the insetting world for just the technology yes. that borderlines on magical that these people live with. Because if you uh, went up and showed someone an iPhone from the from the Dark Ages, yeah. guess what? You're a sorcerer. That quote, uh, I believe it's uh, Clark who, who had it, this sort of Arthur like- Arthur C. Clark. Arthur C. Clark, the uh, sufficiently advanced yeah. technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's basically what this game is based around. Yeah. And so it's sci-fi fantasy. Looking through the book and loving Jack Vance tells the dying earth. Yes. It is. A, to me, a return mm -hmm. to that idea Absolutely. where fantasy and sci-fi are completely intertwined right. and there is no dis difference and they're made stronger from yeah. being put back together. And, and I think it's in that respect, it is a, it's a refreshingly <clears throat> new setting. A lot of the tropes are familiar. It's still, you know, they, they're still a medieval style setting in which case mm -hmm. most people are subsistence farmers. There's not, a, the civilization isn't as complex or built up as it could be. Yeah. Um, but, but there it, might be pockets. But there might be pockets of it. And there are yeah. certainly pockets of it that are able to keep the technology from previous civilizations working. Right. And they use that. So where D&D turns to magic for a lot of its advancements in its civilizations, Numenera turns to super science right. and super technology. 
um, and the things that you can do, there's you know nanite clouds that completely alter the, the molecular composition of, of, uh, of anything that they come into contact with that are just part of the natural weather phenomenon. There's a worldwide data sphere that's basically sort of a dormant internet that some people are able to tap into and some people aren't, but it's maintained by satellites that are still up in orbit just waiting for someone to find a way to activate them. Right, uh, they're just waiting for new orders. Right, microscopic machines that permeate everything on the planet that mm -hmm. certain types of characters can tap into and access and manipulate. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a campaign world that's completely different. There is very little to latch onto as a point of reference. Yeah. for the setting. And so in that way, the setting is very inaccessible. It's a lot like, it reminds me a lot like Planescape, which Monty Cook, coincidentally, spent a lot of time working on in second edition. Planescape was this setting that had, that was brilliant and it had a lot of intricacies and a lot of moving parts to it and it was amazing and it had its own lingo and lore right. and backstory right. and it was utterly incomprehensible unless you read everything about it. Numenera ventures into that in some point. So give an example of this. The monsters that you that a DM would use to create a story out of or create opposition, they're all new. There's very little that that even, you know, even looks like something that you might be familiar with if all you've ever played is traditional fantasy. Well, yeah, because our fantasy is based off of, you know, real world mythology. So right. elves and goblins and dwarves and or, you know, I mean, yeah. these There's are sort of a these are all frame of reference. Yeah, they're yeah. all in our in our in our mythos and our pop culture. In a lot of ways, I think that Dungeons and Dragons has helped propel that since the 70s to, to where we are now uh, in terms of just the fact that people know what an orc is yeah. or an elf outside of this very narrow range of players and, and people who, are, who like fantasy literature. Yeah, or before people who just read Tolkien. Right. And so with Numenera, there's not that common frame of reference. Right. And so DMs are going to have to do a lot of work in terms of looking at the setting, what's in the setting that they like, what's in the setting that they don't like. They're gonna have to read the, the, the creature manual, basically, the, the, both in the main rule book and in the separate, um, the beastiary. separate beastiary of the ninth world. Just to get a feel for it, they're gonna have to build up their store of, of knowledge about this world. And in that respect, it, it might take you know veteran DMs and veteran players having to approach this game as if they were brand new players and brand new DMs mm -hmm. and sort of retrain themselves in how they think about the game and how they approach the game. They can't assume anything. And that can be an asset because you don't have a bunch of monsters that all your players who are playing fir first level characters already know how to kill because right. they've done that in previous campaigns. Because past. they've done that in previous campaigns. And that can be an asset. That also, can be a real asset. Let's dig in just a little bit uh, into the mechanics of how Numenera works just to give just to try to entice some people if they yeah. want to play it this is because it's a lot of fun and that's my that's the thing that I lot. have to say is like this is a fun system it is fun fast and from a DM perspective the system gets the hell out of the way yeah. It does not get in the way of, of anything. There's, I never found a moment in, in running the campaigns that I have for uh, using the Cypher system that I was like, man, I really wish the rules did something different. I really, it, it's just like, it's fast. And so let's talk about why it's fast. Okay. And there are three things that I, that I would recommend to new players keep in mind when they are uh, approaching the system. Number one, everything has a level. And it's level one through 10. Mm -hmm. And you multiply that level by three to get the number on a D20 roll. Uh, that you need to beat. So for instance, a level one task means you have to get a three or above on yeah. your D20. Easy. Easy. So if you roll a one or a two, you failed. Yeah. Uh, astute viewers will note that, that uh, you can't roll a 30 on a D20. And so there are things that a player can do to lower the difficulty of something. Exactly. There's a lot of different ways. Skills lower the difficulty of something. Having special equipment or, or training can also lower the difficulty on something. And then players can also spend uh, what's known as effort mm -hmm. to lower the difficulty of something. Yeah. And then how much they, how much, uh, they spend on effort uh, can be you know, decreased according to how powerful their character is. Yeah. So that's, in a nutshell, the basic part of the game. And that describes everything. Do I want to cast a spell at a creature? It's Ooh, a level seven creature. It's a level seven creature. I got to lower it by at least one because seven times three is 21. Can't get that on a die. You start thinking in terms like that. The second thing that I would ask players to keep in mind or people who might be uh, unfamiliar with it and want to try it out is that the players roll all the dice. Yeah. I would keep a d20 and a d6 behind the, uh, you know, with me just in case I needed them. Is a player attacking a creature? Then they're making a, a, a roll against that creature's level. Is that creature attacking them? 
then they are making a defense role for themselves against so, that level against of against that level of attack. So to me, it resulted in a much faster uh, resolution of mechanics. Not only do you not have to do anything, since the players do have to do everything, you are more as a player you are more engaged for the entirety of the combat. Instead of going, oh, I, I rolled a hit, you know, mm -hmm. call me when it's my turn again, I'm gonna go smoke or make a sandwich. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 now it's the DM's turn and you have to roll to defend. So right. you're engaged further more into, in the combat. In the combat, yeah. Some things that I noticed when DMing that were drawbacks because you're not rolling dice. For me, it was difficult to tell how much trouble you guys might be having with a fight. Yeah. Because I'm not rolling damage, I'm not rolling for how often it hits, there's just, it's something that's not on my plate, something that only you're taking care of, uh, the player's taking care of. Yeah. And so I found it more difficult to gauge like, okay, was that fight tough for you guys? Right, right. We'll get into like some specifics of the campaigns we've run, we can talk about those, those fights in a second, but I, mm -hmm. I do think that that's just something for DMs to keep in mind. You have a solution for that, which is sort of more bookkeeping on the DMs in, just well, kind of keeping track of their pools. Again, one of the things about Numenera, instead of all the, you know, six stats, your abilities, you only, you have three pools. Right. You have your might pool, mm -hmm. you have your speed pool, right. and you have your uh, intellect pool. Uh -huh. And so, if any one of those pools gets depleted to zero, right. if I'm remembering correctly, your character's knocked out. It's kind of knocked out, yeah. You don't You're, want those, uh, you any don't one want those of resources being. But that's the thing is, it could be any one of those. You don't just have a chunk of hit points and that's it. Right. And so it, it becomes a resource management for the player. Yeah. If I want to do an attack based on my speed pool and mm -hmm. keep my might pool just for my health, then you can do that. Then you can do that, yeah. So for the DM, it might behoove you to just make sure you have the pools written down. And when they say, okay, I'm spending five points out of my speed pool yeah. to do this thing so I can move and attack. Yeah. All right, well, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, now five. he only has 20 speed pool speed points left. Right. And just, I, I mean, it, since the DM's not rolling, Yeah. I could see myself like, because I'd, l I'd love to run a Numenera game because it does seem so freaking easy. Yeah. You, you were literally like sitting back the whole time like this. Cool. Yeah. Well, then you do that. Then yeah. Do that. Awesome. Yeah. That's what the experience was of it was like for running uh, Numenera is yeah. that I can focus 100% on what I want to have happen at the table, whether that's uh, you know, sort of like plotting out what my NPC's reactions are, mm -hmm. how they're going to proactively engage with players, what, what are the consequences of player actions. I didn't have to worry at all about the mechanics because all it took was going, all right, I need to pick a number between one and 10 of how difficult this thing should be. And once I've picked that number, that determines everything. That determines the level that, they, that the players have to, uh, to key against. It, if you're talking about monsters, it helps determine their armor, their health, how much damage they're gonna do. Mm -hmm. So all you need to do is pick a number between one and 10. And that's yeah. so simple and easy, you can just do it right there. And then that leads into the third point I have about people and what, what defines Numenera and the Cypher system is a concept known as GM intrusions. Yeah. So GMs are not uh, rolling dice. They're not, uh, th and that means they're not critting against a the player. They're not, uh, they're those unexpected things that happen when uh, a player's rolling, or when a DM is rolling dice against the players and like, oh man, that was a really good hit. And oh man, that's a really good die roll. Uh, those kind of things can happen, mm -hmm. but the Cypher system has a, a mechanic known as GM intrusions, where the GM, and they happen under two circumstances. A player rolls a fumble, yep. usually in, in combat, specifically, right. um, but not necessarily. They roll a one on the dice. The GM can say, here's a complication. I am going to intrude here and say there is a complicating factor. Mm -hmm. that is going on. And I can hand that player that, that experiences that complicating factor two XP, which in Numenera terms is about half of what you need to, to gain a single level up, sort of like. Well, a you third, need like a third. A third. Because there's like, yeah, there's you six get, things to, right. to level up. So two you, experience points, you can buy yourself a, a training and a skill temporarily. Uh, it, they're not nothing. Yeah. And so you get two experience points. One of those experience points goes to the player who suffers the intrusion. The other experience point goes to another player. Of that, that of players, of that player's choice. Right. And in some ways it's similar to inspiration in fifth edition. Yeah. In which players then can engage with other players and go, you know what, I really think you've been, you've been on a hot streak with role playing today. Let me give you one of my experience points. Yeah. The player also has an opportunity if a GM intrusion has been, uh, is in play 
to spend a point of XP to say, no, thank you, don't want that GM intrusion. Yeah, I don't need the floor no, flying no, no, out uh, my, in my, my lifelong enemy has not tracked me down and is about to attack me. Yeah. I'm spending an XP to, to do that. And then the yeah. DM goes, all right, no problem, and they save that for later. Right. So uh, what I, the challenge I found with GM intrusions, number one, was just remembering that they were an option. Yeah. Outside of outside of combat situations when you roll a one, and number two, coming up with uh, a, a large pool of both generic and character specific intrusions that you can uh, throw at the players. So Numenera is amazing in that uh, the way that the rule book is laid out. There's these sort of sidebars on every page. Sometimes they reference other things in the mo in the manual, so you know exactly. They're sort of like a a cross referenced in the text itself. Mm -hmm. But then they also will give you hints for what does a GM intrusion look like for this monster? Right. How does this work? And so it, it gives you a springboard for uh, for using this new mechanic uh, that that if you're a first time DM of Numenera, you might be a little uncomfortable with, might mm -hmm. not use it. There's a part at which it feels like you're actively kind of like out to get the players, like oh I'm going to intrude on you, and this is going to make life more miserable for you or more complicated. But there's a well, it is a risk know, reward. It's a risk reward, and if a player is really worried about GM intrusions, then they should always have a couple of XP in their back pocket to say no, thank you, I don't want that. Right. Um, but at the same time, GM intrusions are an important source of experience points for the player. So maybe you let it happen and take that one experience point, give the other one to a player. But those three things, that everything has a level from one to ten, mm -hmm. that players roll all the dice, and that GM intrusions are a core mechanic, are the, to me the defining features of the Cypher system. Yeah. The thing I love about Numenera is your character is basically broken up into three parts. Right. Right? And, it, and it, it, it's interesting how 5th edition kind of feels a little that way now also. In some ways, yeah, yeah, between you have your background, background, race, and class, yeah. Race, it will also class and subclass. Uh -huh. Of these three things, you are an adjective noun that verbs. Right. I am a strong glaive, which is the fighter type. Right. I am a strong glaive that masters weapons. Right. Okay? You're gonna be really strong, have more on your might pool. Of the three classes in Numenera, there's glaive, there's nano, mm -hmm. And then there's uh, Jack. Jack. I'm sorry, yeah. I was thinking explore from that. They are what they sound like. Glaive is fighter. Nano is a wizard. And Jack is kind of a kind Jack of a, of all trades. Jack of all trades. Yeah. You're kind of a roguish. You can do some movement. You can do some fighting stuff. Maybe you have a a, a, a nano uh, esoteric as mm -hmm. they're called. Mm -hmm. Those are the three main classes. Yeah. Then you have your. Uh, those are the descriptors, mm -hmm. right? And then there's the um, what's the the adjective is called the. Oh man, I mean this is one of those things where our, our we might want to pause, Trev. Pause it. So we don't look like assholes. Focus. There's three. No, no, no. no. Focus. Descriptor, focus, and no, it's type. Descri yeah. Okay, so your descriptor is your strong, your right. strong willed. You're strong, graceful, graceful, nimble, nimble. quick, brilliant. The, there, there's uh, in expanded and more in the bigger cypresses. There's actually things like clumsy, right? Negative which, descriptors, which give you some weird things. But uh, there's a lot of positive in those too. Right. Dim-witted or, or something like that is one, but you can't ever be charmed, right? Because you're you're just too dumb <laughs> to be charmed. So think about that. Yeah. So you, there's your descriptor, uh -huh. which just gives you some points in your in in one of your pools, and it gives you like one or two things, like training in something or right. whatever. It's very much like a background. Round. Very much, yeah. Uh, then there's your your uh, focus. Mm -hmm. The last thing, which is the verb part of the uh, yes, the, the yes. verb part, the last part. You have your your descriptor. You have your your type. Mm -hmm. Now your focus is masters weapons, or one of my favorites, bears a halo of fire. Bears a halo of fire. Talks to machines. Talks to machines. Slays mutants. Slays mutants. <laughs> murders. <laughs> murders is one. There's a description that's just like, I'm a, I'm a strong glaive that murders. That murders. And uh, you're really good at killing things. Yes. And that's, uh, rides the lightning, skulks in the dark. Oh, ride, uh, rides the lightning. Explores dark places. Yeah, rides the lightning would be the way I made Th Theron in right. Numenera. In Numenera. He, he would be a, 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 a intelligent <laughs> nano that rides the lightning. Right. And it's all lightning damage, and you can teleport from one place to another. One place to another. And so th I, I love the way that characters are made in Numenera because of that, the adjective noun who verb. The first time I got Numenera, I was like, I gotta play Planescape with this. It seemed the perfect fit. And so yeah. I ran uh, the uh, stair uh, Infinite Staircase, Tales from the Infinite Staircase, oh, uh, using uh, Numenera and just con with no prep conversion at all. No. I would sit down, I would read a chapter that I was gonna run out of the Tales of the Infinite Staircase, I would let it percolate in my mind a bit, mm -hmm. and then we'd play. And I would use a rough guide from hit dice to level, and that was it. 
Yeah. Everything else was converted on the fly yeah. while it was happening. And so the, the, the classes, the characters that you guys were able to make using Cypher would have been a nightmare to make in D&D. Oh my God. So the, <laughs> the party consisted of a fairly straightforward Bariar brawler. You know, for those of you unfamiliar with Planescape, they're basically like a goat centaur. A rogue Modron, yeah. who eventually uh, became a gnome because of some time that they, uh, a 12 foot tall gnome, uh, because of some time they spent in limbo. Yeah. Um, a Lantern Archon, the spirit of an actually dead PC from another campaign. Yeah, um, well, because Emma, anybody who's watched the live play, plays a character Fabian all the Fabian, time. Yeah. And our this other was, friend, uh, Autumn, right. wanted to play a version of Fabian, so he played the version after he had died after and had become died. a Lantern Archon right. and was going through the planes. He's on the infinite staircase, uh, far from home, but your character, uh, who was a living psychic weapon bred by Elithids, to do yeah. whatever it is that the lithids breed psychic weapons to do. Well, I, I just saw it as like River Tam right. from Firefly, right. but taken to the fantasy nth degree. Absolutely. Yeah. Like in, instead of martial arts, but if they mess with your brain to make you telekinetic and yeah. whatever. And so yeah, I made I made her name. Her name was TK808, which was her designation <laughs> in the Illithid you know, hive mind, uh -huh. she was a telekinetic number 808. Right. And she escaped. And she escaped. And when the adventure started, it was literally like, the adventure started 15 minutes after she walked through a portal and ended up in, we're, we started in Sigil, right? Uh, you started in Sigil, yeah. Yeah, we started in, yeah. so she had 15 minutes after walking through a portal she found out about uh, to get away from the Illithid co right. colony. And that's where we started the adventure. That's where we started. So we have this, we have this party that's just all over the place. It would have been very difficult to run. In, uh, in any edition of D&D. &D. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, I decided like Numenera and, uh, and just the cipher system in general would perfect fit for, for Planescape. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done other things. We've run a Star Wars game using the cipher system oh, set, uh, you know, set in the, the days uh, after Return of the Jedi. And, uh, right, yeah, right after. Right after Return of the Jedi. And you guys were scoundrels mm -hmm. uh, looking to steal Jabba's fortune. Well, and, uh. <laughs> and what's worth noting, I think, in that one also is uh, we were using, we were both droids, because it was me and Josh, yes. your brother Josh, mm -hmm. yeah. and we were both droids. Yes. So we're on a Star Wars adventure with two droids, two droids. out to accomplish a task, which yeah. is about as Star Wars as you can get. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was really great. Um, um, and then there's been some others that I've played sort of one-offs uh, where we're, you know, we're playing actually in the Ninth World setting. Yeah. Um, and so to kind of return a bit to the ninth world and what I love about the weird post-apocalyptic science fantasy of it, because I'm actually at the moment prepping to run a Numenera campaign, an honest to goodness Numenera campaign. Um, and, and so like, there's a concept in there that there's a, 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 something called the Wandering Way, which yeah. is sort of like this road that winds and touches in every land and, and, and corner of the supercontinent. Uh, yeah. You can sort of go on a pilgrimage on it. Like so, the Silk Road. Like the Silk Road. And or the, so Or you, their version of the infinite staircase. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so you're sort of pilgrims on this road, and that can be one way that you uh, approach it. And so it's just like you're traveling, and uh, you know you, a different adventure takes place in a different location, and you maybe sort of gloss over the travel in between, or maybe you don't. Um, I can see it being really fun, sort of like listening to rumors as they as travelers pass each other by, you know, mm -hmm. whether you're going east to west or, or, or uh, west to east. Yeah. Uh, another way that I can see ha uh, having a campaign is where your characters are part of a, uh, there's a, a group in Numenera, uh, the Ninth World setting, called the Aeon Priests, members yeah. of the Order of Truth, and they're sort of like historian scientists who are trying to uncover the wonders of a lost age for the benefit of, of mankind. Yeah, got to get back on top. Got to get back on top. And so, uh, you know, you maybe play one of these isolated secular monasteries and the community that's grown up around it, mm -hmm. and you play out of that, and it's just sort of, you build on this community that your members, that your characters are a part of, um, and then maybe there's something that comes along that, uh, that you know, causes them to have to leave home. and sort of uncover the unknown. Yeah, a, uh, a great book for inspiration on that idea is uh, by my favorite author, Neil Stevenson. It's called Anathem. Yeah. And yeah, it's a, it's a beast of a book to get through. It's but, a beast of a book, but, but, but just, the first 100, 150 pages of it is perfect fodder for a Numenera campaign. Because they have these three items that they can use, and they're right. vast technology. They're you know a ball that can inflate to the size of a raft. Right. But they carry it around and it's use like it that. as a baseball also. Yeah. 
because it's nanotech. Because why not? And you know, uh, it, it, it's just, it's perfect for that. When I read Numenera, uh, either the, the specific Numenera setting or just the generic Cypher system, my mind is like, I wanna run 50 million games with this. I wanna run a supers game and a modern day sort of uh, eldritch horror type yeah, game. Yeah, some Lovecraft shit. Some Lovecraft shit. And so I think that, I mean, even just if, if you take the generic uh, Cypher system, there are rules for running it in a pure fantasy game. Mm -hmm. So that you have uh, foci that are things like bears a spell book, or right. carries a spell book, because they can be more like a traditional D&D wizard. Uh, you can run it uh, using sort of like hardcore sci-fi and less science fantasy. Yeah. Uh, so as a system, it lends itself well to a variety of different play styles and different genres. Mm -hmm. And I, I like it because if, you, if, you, if you're a DM and you find yourself that the, the game parts of the game, the mechanics of the game are, you just, you're, you're not interested in them. Or whenever you sit down to, uh, to prep for a scenario, mm -hmm. you find yourself like really excited about what's gonna happen and how the players are gonna interact with the world and what's going on. But when it comes to actually making a monster or making an NPC, you just find you don't care. Yeah. A system like Cypher, uh, is one of those that the system just gets out of the way. Pick the level, that's it, you're done. Yeah. And you can focus on what you like about actually playing the game at the table mm -hmm. as opposed to worrying about the mechanics uh, away from the table. Exactly. And, a, and another small thing that speaks to that simplicity, one thing I love, some people might not like because they like specificity in their weapons, but the fact that there's just light, medium, and heavy weapons, yeah. and they do two, four, and six damage, yep. and that's it. That's it. Do you have a long sword or do you have a hammer? It doesn't matter, it does it four matter. damage because it it's damage. a medium weapon. It could be a hunk of metal with a cat at the end. Right. Who gives a shit? It, it that's just the thing. looks it's, like what it looks like. It looks like whatever you want it to look like and they all do specific damage, so it's just like, you just know it's less stuff you have to look up and, yeah. re and reference in the book. Yeah. It's just getting out of its own way sometimes. It just gets out of its own way. And the system as a whole, both in how it's written and the way the rules work, really assumes that players and GMs will work it out. Yeah. And it trusts them to make the decisions necessary to make the game work. And so its lack of specificity is an asset. If you read the rule book, they're like, hey, we're not giving you rules. We don't provide a comprehensive skill list because you don't need one. Yeah, you might need a skill that we don't provide, we and you're like, provide. well, it's not in the book, so yeah. I guess you can't do No, no screw that. No, you just have it. Have it. You just have it. To reference the, plan the, the, the Planescape game, since we were using a D&D uh, &D lore, like we just added planar knowledge for my character. Right. Because she started traveling the planes right. and got trained in it and specialized in it. Yeah. Um, I, and so uh, it's, it's easily adaptable for pretty much any situation that you want to run your game in. Yeah. And that's that's... That's what I love about it. And also, you can get the big ass book. Yeah. But if you're not actually running the game, you can get this tiny just little Just get this little $20 guy. Tells you about And it that. tells you everything you need to make a character. Yeah. And it's all you need. Yeah. Uh, and so, why not? And so, why not? And so, I, you know, it, it rules light games like Numenera uh, are not for everybody. Some people like the crunch of mechanics, they like mm -hmm. the mechanical precision of it. But if you are one of those people where even 5th edition is too many rules for you yeah. or too much going on, uh, a game like Numenera, or, or like I said, the generic cipher system is, um, is, is perhaps an option for you. Most definitely. Um, and I mean, in, in a much broader sense, there are more games out there than D&D. And while we are WebDM and we love our D&D, we also love other games as well. And, you know, I uh, just might talk about other games in the future That'd now that nice. we've gone ahead and uh, pop this show cherry. <laughs> <laughs> if I want to get, no, is that too vulgar? Is that too vulgar? Now that we've breached this door? <laughs> no? Yeah. Am, I, am, I, am I pressing now? <laughs> Don't want to force it. And they have a reference to go to so we don't have to be as specific. Whereas Numenera, half these people might not have this book. So we are going to be their only source. So we're gonna have to talk about things a little bit more in depth I don't know. Yeah, I don't want to be. I, I want to give them a, give enough breakdown of the rules of Numenera yeah. so that they know what we're talking about. And when we say things like how easy it is to DM for, and how it frees the DM to focus on, in, you know, playing the game well uh, and creating interesting scenarios as opposed to worrying about the rules. 
um, which for me was a, a phenomenal experience. To, to DM without ever having to worry about the rules was a, uh, a very interesting thing. Okay. So we ready? Ready. All right. 